Good morning and welcome to Genesis. We are grateful that you decided to make gathering with us a part of your weekend. Service will begin in just a couple of minutes. If you are a Facebook user, we encourage you to open your Facebook app and check in and visit our Genesis Church page to share a link to today's experience. This is a great way to share the ministry of Genesis with those in your circle of influence. Genesis Church uses the Church Center app as our information hub. In the app, you can update your information, check your kids in, register for events, interact with your connect group, 
and even contribute financially to the ministry of Genesis. You can search Church Center in your device's app store. Today's service will begin with a time of singing, followed by corporate reading of scripture and prayer. Then one of our pastors will teach a practical message from God's word. Every service concludes with a time of communion, a practice where followers of Jesus celebrate his death and resurrection as the source of our salvation and spiritual life. If you are new to Genesis, we encourage you to participate at the level of your comfort in any and all aspects of the service. Again, thanks for being here today. It is our hope that you feel at home and experience God's love in a meaningful way.
good God. He's a great God. He's a faithful God. Amen. response to his faithfulness and his greatness. Just overflow, sing it out. How great, how great is our God. Oh, sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. i 
across this place. He's the name of all names. Lift it up. You're the name above all names. And you are worthy of all praise. And my heart will sing how great is our God. You are worthy, Lord. Yeah. How great. Let's give him some praise in this house this morning. How great is our God. So easy in life with everything that goes on, with just so much confusion and pain and hurting. It's so easy for us to forget how great God is. And we start to lean in on our own understanding. We start to lean in ourselves on what we can do. And we begin to place ourselves higher than we should be. And our priorities get out of whack. And then all of a sudden it becomes about what we can do and how I can handle that. We try to take things into our own hands. But I'm here to tell you this morning from experience that I can't do anything on my own. And in all honesty, I don't want to do anything on my own. But this morning, be reminded that we serve a great God. A God who can handle all of your problems, all of your concerns, all of your worries, whatever you're feeling, our God can handle. And we just cry out together. How great is our God. Let's give him some praise again this morning, church, like we believe it. As we do each week, I'm going to invite you to read a passage of scripture with me this morning. It should be on the screen behind us. It's in Psalm 145. I'm going to get us started, and if you would, let's read this out loud together. I exalt you, my God, the King, and bless your name forever and ever. I will bless you every day. I will praise your name forever and ever. The Lord is great and is highly praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation will declare your works to the next and will proclaim your mighty acts. I will speak of your splendor and glorious majesty and your wondrous works. They will proclaim the power of your awe-inspiring acts and I will declare your greatness. They will give a testimony of your great goodness and will joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and great in faithful love. The Lord is good to everyone. His compassion rests on all he has made. And all you have made will thank you, Lord. The faithful will bless you. They will speak of the glory of your kingdom and will declare your might informing all people of your mighty acts and of the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your rule is for all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his actions. The Lord helps all who fall. He raises up all who are oppressed. All eyes look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all his acts. The Lord is near all who call out to him and who all call out to him with integrity. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry for help and saves them. The Lord guards all those who love him, but he destroys all the wicked. My mouth will declare the Lord's praise. Let every living thing bless his holy name forever and ever. Come on, let's give him praise again. How can you not read that and be excited this morning? If you didn't catch that, the Lord is good and he is great. He handles everything. He feeds you. He clothes you. He cares about everything 
about you and that is the God that we serve and we as a people we're not going to let rocks cry out we're not going to let someone else cry out in our place but we are going to lift his name this morning we're not going to exalt ourselves we're not going to praise ourselves we're not going to pat ourselves on the back for what we can do but we're going to give God praise for what God does each and every day do you believe that this morning let's pray together God we come to you today God and we thank you God, that you are a great God, that you are a good God, that we can come here this morning, God, in the middle of a life when things are just going terrible. God, when we can't see a way out of the storm, when everything around us is cloudy and blurry and we're scared, God, but we know that you're good. God, that you extend your hand to us, God, and all we have to do is reach out and grab your hand, God, and you will pull us, God, and it's not because of anything we can do. God, it's not because of our own strength or our own goodness, God, but it's because of what you've already done on the cross for us. So this morning, God, we cry out to you, God, and we exalt and we bless your name because you are a good God. God, you can't be anything but good, and we love you, God. We honor you. We praise you this morning, and we ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Come on, church, one more time, and I'm excited to be here this morning. I hope you are too. Well, we are excited that you are here. If you would, before you're seated, turn around and say hi to a couple people. Let them know you're glad to see them this morning. Again, we are so glad that you are here with us this morning on this beautiful Memorial Day weekend. And it is a very special day uh, here with us this morning because we are going to be honoring a few of our seniors who accomplished quite the task of graduating high school. Let's give them a round of applause. It's a huge accomplishment. So we are going to get started with our honorees this morning. Our first senior is Brehan Bussey. He is graduating from OVCA. His parents are Latara Bussey and Rupert Hanying. He has attended Genesis for one year. He says that each and every memory that he has made with Fuse is his favorite. His favorite Bible verse is Matthew 28, 5 through 6. The angel said to the woman, be not afraid, for he has risen. His future plans include becoming a diesel mechanic. If Brehan could pick any superpower, he says that he would pick super speed so that he can get from point A to point B quickly. If he could describe his high school experience with a song title, it would be Leave Me Alone by NF. His best excuse for getting out of homework was that he had no Wi-Fi. And the trend that he was most embarrassed to have been a part of was saggy pants and gold chains. Our next senior is Austin Moore. He is graduating from Moore High School. His parents are Matt and Carrie Moore. And they have attended Genesis for six years. He says that his favorite Fuse memory is every single camp experience. His favorite Bible verse is Genesis 6-4. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. When the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them, they were the heroes of old and the men of renown. His future plans include going to OCCC. He says that his superpower would be mind control because he's a control freak. If he could describe his high school experience with a song title, it would be Bad Country. His best excuse for getting out of homework was that his laptop is dead. And the trend that he was most embarrassed to be a part of, Justin Bieber hair. And last but certainly not least, we have Amanda Pitts. Amanda is graduating from Westmore High School. Her parents are Paul and Christina Pitts, and they have attended Genesis for one year. 
Her favorite fuse memory is Mission Arlington. And her favorite Bible verse is 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Her future plans include going to OCCC and hair school. She says that her superpower would be invisibility so that she could eavesdrop. If she could describe her high school experience, it would be House of Memories. And the best excuse that she had for getting out of homework was, my dad is in the hospital. And the uh, most embarrassing trend that she was a part of was duck face. Man, but we are uh, so excited for these three students. Yeah, go ahead and give them a round of applause again. It's always such a, a bittersweet time for us because we absolutely love um, our students and then sometimes we're blessed to get rid of some. So thank you, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, they have been phenomenal. Uh, we're really lucky in Fuse to just have a group of great students um, and each one of them are great. We've never had problems, which thank you uh, that we've never had problems. But you guys always make an impact. You always have such great attitudes. Smiles are contagious. To see the growth that you've had. Brahan and Amanda have only been here for a year, but you will definitely be missed. And the growth that you've had in the year um, has been phenomenal. We've loved having you. Amo, man, you've been here forever. Your growth has been incredible, dude, uh, just to be honest, just to see how you were. We had to kidnap him. Uh, one time he wanted to skip a few weeks in a row, which we don't allow. So we showed up, we kidnapped him, carried him out. We have a video if you want to, it was planned, like it was okay. So before you call the police, uh, it wasn't a real kidnapping, but, uh, you guys are awesome. Uh, we are so excited to see what God has in store for you in your next chapter. We want to remind you, um, that no matter what life throws at you in this next chapter of life, no matter what you may face, that there's one consistency, right? And that's Jesus. And as we read it this morning, and we know already that God is good, and he's always with you, so I want to encourage you to stay close to him. If everything around you changes, go to, go to him, because he's consistent, he's faithful, and he's good, right? I think we have a few gifts uh, for you that we want to honor you guys with this morning. And then church family, if you would, go ahead and stand with us this morning. Uh, we are going to pray for these students uh, this is Amanda, Austin, and Brahan. If you would, uh, just go ahead and reach your hands forward towards them, and let's pray for them this morning. God, we come to you again this morning, God, and we thank you for your faithfulness. God, we thank you for the impact that you have had, God, and the, and the impact that you're going to have on the lives of these students. God, we thank you for how far um, that you have gotten them. God, we thank you for the things that you've allowed them to overcome so far. God, and as this next chapter of life starts for them, God, we ask that you would put your hand of protection on them. God, that they would feel your presence, that you would give them the wisdom they need, God, to know what steps to make, what decisions are, uh, are there. God, that they would seek after you, uh, God, and they would strive to be more like you, God, and help them to always remember that you are there and that you are faithful. God, and as long as they are just uh, staying close to you, that they are co staying committed to you, God, that there's nothing that they won't be able to handle, God, and it's again because of what you've done. So this morning, God, we thank you for these students. We thank you for um, all of the things that they've done and all that they're going to do, God. We thank you, we love you, and we ask this in your name. Amen. Can we get up for these students one more time, church family? Go ahead and let David get a picture real quick. All right, church family, you can go ahead and be seated.
Well, good morning again. Welcome to Genesis. Good to see such a great looking crowd on Memorial Day weekend. So props to you seniors for being cool enough that extra people want to show up and say congratulations to you so that we do not have a typical Memorial Day weekend crowd. So we plan that pretty well. So today we kick off a brand new series in the book of Psalms. And when people think of the Psalms, they have a tendency to just think happy, clappy songs of praise and thanksgiving. And there certainly are a number of psalms that are happy, clappy, joyful, resounding in praise in nature. But the book of Psalms is actually broken up into five different books, five different genres of psalms that really give full expression to the human experience. There are psalms of praise that are sung from the mountaintop of experience when life is good and God is good and those two two things reconcile together and we find invitations to sing songs of thanksgiving and joy. But the Psalms also give expression to the reality of life that sometimes life sucks, that sometimes life is hard. Sometimes, as we've seen in the last couple weeks, our world is filled with pain and suffering in reason for grief and sorrow and lament. And the Psalms give us a language for seasons like that, that even when life is not good, God is still good. And we hold those truths in tension. And the Psalms challenge us to grow in our faith as we trust God, even in the difficult seasons. So it's going to be our hope that over the next several weeks, as we do a deep dive on some of these individual Psalms from the different genres, that it will challenge us that it will inspire us, and it will give us the ammunition to grow. So today I get the honor of kicking off this series. You're going to hear from a multitude of speakers over the next several weeks. You can say glory, hallelujah, amen to that, because it won't be all me. But today I'm going to get us started with Psalm 136. Now, Psalm 136 is a special type of psalm called call and response. It would have been a psalm that was saying in the, the worship settings of ancient Jews, this would have been a psalm that Jesus would have grown up singing in the synagogue. And it's structured in such a, such a way that it invites or really requires crowd participation. So I know we've already read scripture together this morning, but we're going to do so again. So I want you to stand with me today. Psalm 136 is structure, structured in such a way that I will read the top line, and then in unison, with some gusto, you are to declare the bottom line. So they're going to put the first one on the screen. We'll practice with it and establish our rhythm, and then we'll go from there. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. That was beautiful, and this is how easy it's going to be. Your line doesn't change. So I I need you to maintain that energy all the way through. So here we go. We're going to do verse 1 again. You guys were so awesome. Here we go. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. He alone does great wonders. He made the heavens skillfully. He spread the land on the waters. He made the great lights. The sun to rule by day. The moon and stars to rule by night. He struck the firstborn of the Egyptians. And brought Israel out from among them. With a strong hand and outstretched arm. He divided the Red Sea. And led Israel through. He hurled Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea. He led his people in the wilderness. He struck down great kings. And slaughtered famous kings. Sihon, king of the Amorites. And Og, king of Bashan. And gave their land as an inheritance. 
an inheritance to Israel, his servant. He remembered us in our humiliation and rescued us from our foes. He gives food to every creature. Give thanks to the God of heaven. Give yourselves a round of applause. That was awesome. You may be seated. Some of you got a little too excited on he slaughtered famous kings. You were like, his faithful love endures forever. That's my kind of God. Some of you are like, whoa, you toned that down a little bit. That's all right. You guys were awesome today. So this call and response is a literary device that's used in poetry and literature. It's used throughout various uh, musical genres, maybe most familiar tribal chants, um, the Afro, uh, the Negro spirituals. Um, you find them in military drills. Some of you that were in the Marines or Army likely engaged in call and response chants. You find them in kind of the ancient uh, work songs, like I've been working on the railroad as people are working along. One person would lead the major line, and then other people would call in response. You even find it in a lot of modern music today, Happy by Pharrell Williams, huh? Clap along if you feel like a room without a view because I'm happy. I'm not going to sing the whole thing. But Austin Moore, who was up here earlier, is one of our graduates. He rocked out to this at karaoke Friday night at Fuse Underground. And I think we've got some video of that this morning. I'm joking. Austin, I'm kidding, bro. I love you. I love you. I would not do that to you. We may post it to Facebook. We're not going to show it this morning, though. But he absolutely killed Happy. But that's a great call and response. Now, there, there were a couple songs that I was like, oh, that's a great one. Uh, it was kind of an 80s rock song, but Def Leppard, that was a beautiful example. But I was like, Ugh, that's a little too sexually charged of a song for me to mention. And then this other one was so obvious. But I was like, Lord, I'm not sure I can do this. And for some of you cowboy fans and Longhorn fans, you're going to like feel this. But the most obvious example is this, Boomer. Ah, yeah. oh, sorry. Sorry, I just had to wash that out of my mouth. Now, we're going to be engaging in songs of lament in the coming weeks and I had prepared to use Wu Pig Suey as an example today after our Lady Razorbacks completed finishing off the Texas Longhorns, but unfortunately they were able to do so yesterday, um, and so we're just not going to focus any more attention on that because they lost and my heart hurt last night. But call and response device has a way of calling attention to and engaging, inviting participation. As we were reading that scripture, you were way more focused and way more engaged than you would have been had I just read all 26 verses to you. Some of you would have done what some of the babies in the room and some of you do on a typical Sunday and you would have nodded off and somebody would have had to elbow you on the side. But because it invited participation, you were made way more engaged than you normally would have been. And really Christian worship is nothing less than an invitation to, to participate in the life of the triune God. The Psalms are, some of the Psalms are structured in this call and response because that's the life that we've been invited into. It calls out about the character and the nature of God. It calls out to us, this is who God is. This is what God has done. And it invites us to live in faithful response. And because we know in Hebrews 13 and 8, it says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. As we are reminded who God is and what God has done, we can live in confidence knowing that this is who God will be. This is what God will do because he does not change. And as it calls out to us as a reminder that God is good, God is faithful, God provides, God's presence is with us, it calls us into a place of response. The revelation of God's nature and character call us to a life of faithful response. We're all familiar today with the very first commandment found in Exodus 20 and 3. 
that do not have any other gods beside me. And if you grew up in a real fundamentalist background like I did, we recoil at that a little bit because it evokes images of God standing over the balcony of heaven saying, these are the rules, you better follow them. Don't do that, don't do that, uh-uh, you better not do that. Well, no, you better change. And, and we, we have this image of God as like, okay, God delivered them, and then God gave them the rules, and if they don't follow the rules, there's going to be hell to pay. But right before verse 3, before God starts issuing any law, any command, any rule, there's this verse. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. What does that verse do? It calls to remembrance who God is. I am the Lord your God. It calls to remembrance what God has done. I delivered you. You were in slavery for 400 years. No hope. No freedom, no ability to free yourself. But because my faithful love endures forever, I heard your cry. Because my faithful love endures forever, I came to you. Because my faithful love endures forever, I rescued you. Because my faithful love endures forever, I performed miracles on your behalf. And I rescued you and I brought you out of the land of slavery. Why would you have any other gods before me? Nobody has loved you like I've loved you. Nobody has done for you what I've done for you. Nobody can do for you what I've done for you because I am the Lord your God. There is none like me. It was in response to who God was and who God is and what God has done that he calls them into a life of faithful worship. You see, we have a tendency when we read the Egypt story of God's, or the Exodus story of God's deliverance from Egypt, to think that Sinai was the end of the story. Moses on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, fire and smoke and thunder and lightning and the ground shook and the Israelites at the bottom of the mountain going, oh my gosh, like what is going on? And Moses emerges from the cloud with the stone tablets with the law written on them and we think that's the end of the story. God delivered them, then he gave them the rules to live by, but that's not the end of the story. We have a tendency to think that the resurrection of Jesus is the the finale of our salvation story. That Jesus came, he showed us how to live, he died on the cross to forgive us of our sins, he rose again to give us everlasting life, and then the rest of the New Testament are kind of the rules to live by. That like do this, and if you're pretty good at it, you're going to go to heaven when you die, but that's not the end of the story. The end of the, ex- the, end of the Exodus story is not Sinai. It's not Moses coming down with the rules because when Moses was up there, God spoke something else. Gave him the details of the tabernacle, the tent in the wilderness where God would meet with his people. God didn't give them rules to live by. God gave them himself. He said, I want you to build a tent, Moses, because these are my people and I am their God. And I'm not just going to sit up in heaven and watch this thing play out. I'm going to dwell among them. It was an invitation into communion with God. It was invitation into participation in the life of the triune God. It wasn't just do this and don't do that. It was like, hey, this is the worship environment that I want you to create so that I can dwell with my people. I'm going to lead them with a cloud by day and a fire by night. Why? Because my faithful love endures forever. I don't want religious robots. I want a people. I want a family, and I want to dwell with them. The resurrection is not the end of our story because afterwards, what happened? God sends the Spirit to fill us, to indwell us with power. Why? So that we can live in communion with God, that we might live on commission with God, with new identities and a new purpose in this world we're not just hanging out waiting for heaven God is working in us and through us to bring renewal and restoration to this broken world right here right now and our lives are lived in response to who God is and what God has done thank you for those few I was going to break out my line I'm preaching better than y'all are amen and it's been a while but the reality today is all of life is worship We're all worshipers. Today, you may be not a Christian. You may be of a different faith. We all worship something. We all have longings and desires. 
that our life is geared toward. We all have a belief in what is ultimately going to bring satisfaction and fulfillment in our lives. And we order our lives around that belief. Now, honestly, today, there are some that profess to be Christian today. But the undergirding belief of your life, the current that carries you, carries you, is the belief that the things of this world are ultimately going to fulfill and satisfy. But we're all worshipers. We're all carried by some underlying belief, vision of the good life, and we order our lives around it. One of the early church fathers, St. Augustine, put it this way. He says, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds rest in you. We were created to worship. We were created for communion with God. And we're looking for something that brings the fulfillment and satisfaction that only God can bring. We find this expression, this longing given expression in Psalm chapter 42. David writes, as a deer longs for flowing streams, so I long for you, God. I thirst for God, for the living God. When can I come and appear before God? David gives expression to that, to that longing that Augustine writes about that we were created for communion with God, but sometimes that longing goes wrong. And we begin to long for the things of this world rather than the things of God. We read about that in Psalm chapter 107. Some wandered in desolate wilderness, finding no way to a city where they could live. They were hungry and thirsty but their spirits failed within them. They were worshipers. They were driven by a longing, a hunger, a thirst, but they were looking for satisfaction in places that do not bring satisfaction, and their spirits failed within them. They lived with that angst, that anxiety, that there must be more to life than this. I've, I've, I've done what the world said to do. I pursued the relationship I pursued the career, the bank account, the bigger house, the nicer car, but my spirit fails within me. There is a disconnect. There was a promise made that was not realized. I'm longing for something, but in the words of you two, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. That's why the Word of God admonishes us in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. Every person in this room today, there is something or some things that in your heart you hold as the greatest value, the highest priority of your life. And all of the energy and the focus of your life flows toward those things. Some of us, we profess one loyalty But the breadcrumbs of our life reveal that we are living according to a different path, a different trajectory. That whatever we hold as the highest value, the greatest priority, ultimately all of the energy of our life flows toward those things. And that's why the Bible calls out, God's word calls out to remind us who God is and what God has done that we might offer our lives in faithful worship to him. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters. And any time we read a therefore, we've got to ask the question, what's it there for? It's a transitional statement that's building on a prior argument. And all throughout the gospel of Romans, Paul has laid out the sinfulness of humanity, our rebellion, our selfishness, the chaos and destruction that sin has brought upon the world. He has laid out the case of God's goodness, who God is, and what God has done. That in spite of our sinfulness, God came to us wrapped in flesh and blood and offered himself up on our behalf because of his faithful love. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that through faith in him, not through our own good works, not through our own righteousness, but through faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ, that we can be justified before God, that we can live in communion with God. And in light of this great gospel of grace, Paul says, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercies, in light of who God is, in light of what God has done, 
I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Romans 12, 1 and 2 is the New Testament equivalent of Exodus 20, 2 and 3. That in light of who God is, in light of what God has done, let us respond rightly by offering ourselves in worship to God that God has called. And our duty is to respond and to respond rightly by ordering our lives around the goodness and the faithfulness of God. But the reality is sometimes we lose sight of God's goodness. Sometimes we get distracted. Sometimes we wonder. Sometimes the busyness, the chaos of life knocks us off track. That's why the word of God calls out to us to remind us, to engage us, to bring our attention to these truths, to invite our participation time and time again. So this morning I want to talk about two anchors that God has given us to keep us fixed in this place of call and response, of remembering who God is and what God has done and offering our lives in worship before him. The first one this morning is corporate worship. Is this right here? What we are doing today matters more than what we can even imagine. I know many of us grew up in environments where people like me put intense pressure on if the doors are open by God, you better be there because that's what good Christians do. And there are some of us here today that our response on Sunday mornings are still driven by this subconscious feeling of duty. That I owe it to God to be here. Because somebody like me said something along the line somewhere in time that if Jesus was willing to die for you, bless God, the least you can do is show up on a Sunday morning, right? Some of you are laughing because you're like... <laughs> PTSD. But today, what we do matters more than what we even realize. Worship, corporate worship. If worship is our response to who God is and what God has done, corporate worship is the training ground for faithful worship. Worship is our response. And if worship is responsive, and if God is our highest value and our greatest priority, then our time should revolve around God. Not in some manipulative, bless God, if the doors are open, you ought to be here. But if God is God, and he is the Lord over our lives, it should reflect in our day-to-day -day lives, our day-to-day -day activities. And if God is God, and he is good, like we declare him to be, if he has done all that we declare him to do, and our lives revolve around him, that it should filter down into the way we structure our time, and we order our calendars. And what better way to give response to the goodness of God than by saying, even though it's often inconvenient, and there are other things I would rather be doing. And if you have a young family, you've, every Sunday is the challenge of getting kids out of bed and dressed and fed and getting here without losing every semblance of Jesus that you have. That even though it costs something, it costs something. Offer yourselves as living sacrifices to God. For this is your holy act of worship. But what's the second half of that verse? There's a promise. For in doing so, you will test and know. And that word know is not informational. It's, it's emotional. It's relational. That's why the Bible, when you read the Old Testament, that husband knew his wife and then a baby came along. He didn't just know her name. He didn't just know her favorite color. I mean, he knew her and something happened. You will test and know, experience what is God's good, perfect, and pleasing will. That when we respond rightly is where we experience God still working in our lives. 
It's not just remembering who God is. It's not just remembering God, what God has done. It is participating in who God is and what God is doing. If our relationship with God has resulted in a new identity, then we should make effort to give expression to that identity. We, I am the Lord, your God. You are my people. You're my family. You're not just a collection of individuals who kind of believe the same thing and are geographically located in the same area and have found a church that kind of fits your needs. No, no, no. We are the people of God. We are the body of Christ. And when we show up, we witness to the world that I'm not just on my own individual journey to heaven, but I belong to somebody. Not only do I belong to God, I belong to God's family. And I'm going to show up because even if I don't realize it, people are depending on me. People in this room need me in ways that I don't even think I can deliver and in ways I don't even realize. Why? Because that's how God created his body to work. But worship is not just responsive. It is also formative. Think about it this way. We all get hungry. So what do we do? We eat. Eating is a response to a natural desire. But eating is also formative. What we eat in response to our hunger matters, right? If we choose to eat good food that nourishes and satisfies at a much deeper level, it trains us to desire that kind of food. But if we give in to our base instincts of only what is most pleasurable in terms of taste, which is typically what is not the healthiest, we, we settle for the superficial nourishment of, oh, I'm going to eat this because it tastes good, but we train ourselves to desire that kind of food, and our health suffers from it. So eating is a response to a very natural desire, but what we choose to eat in response to that desire forms us and shapes us in more ways than what we realize. Well, worship is not just a response. How we choose to worship matters. We've used the phrase over the last several weeks, we, we do things that do things. We used this phrase last week that was in an article. It's a Latin phrase, ex opere operetto, that means the effect is in the doing. That there is power in what we do, often unrealized, indiscernible in the moment. But the author went on to write that if we do something for God in the doing, God does something for us. That's exactly what Paul says. That if we offer ourselves as living sacrifices in view of God's mercy, that in, in offering the right response of worship, we further experience the goodness of grace and the grace of God. That in doing so, we will know, we will experience the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. In much older days, and, and even in some circles today, there's a, a word used to describe what we do here, and it's the word liturgy. If you grew up in low church, Protestant backgrounds like I did, you maybe have never heard the word, or if you did, it was, may have been used derogatorily toward other churches that just participate in dead, dry religion. If you grew up Methodist, Lutheran, Episcopalian, Catholic, that may be a very familiar word to you, but the literal meaning of liturgy is the work of the people. It gives expression to this idea that what we do here today is not the work of professional Christians. It is the work of the body of Christ. Part of the problem that the church ran into over the years was the church became very institutionalized. And power was centered around the professional clergy. In the medieval times, the, the mass was often done in Latin, regardless of geographic location. So you may show up for an hour and a half and participate in a service where you did not understand a single word. And some of you are like, I feel like that sometimes. <laughs> Whatever. 
So there was this disconnect where church was done to the people. And part of the Protestant Reformation was a revolt against that. That church is the work of the people. It's not done by professional Christians to us, but it is the work of the people. And they grabbed power back and decentralized it to remind us that we are the body of Christ. That, that, chur- that church is not a once a week activity. That wherever you are, it is church. Because you are the people of God living on commission with God, I read this, this great uh, bit that was written by Nicholas Wolsterhoff on the Reformation. He says, the Reformers saw the liturgy, listen to this language, as God's action and our faithful reception or response of that action. The governing idea of the Reformed liturgy was twofold. The conviction that to participate in the liturgy is to enter into the the sphere of God's acting, not just God's presence, plus the conviction that we are to appropriate God's actions in faith and gratitude through the work of the Spirit. The church wasn't just something I attended, but it was really a model for how I live my life. The liturgy is the meeting between God and God's people, a meeting in which both parties act, but in which God initiates and we respond. Do you need to say amen to that? What we do matters. Listen, this is part of the reason that we've made significant changes to the structure of our services over the years. And I'm not taking aim at anybody else, any other church, any other tribe, any other way of doing things. But when we fall into this model, we show up, a band stands on stage, sings four songs to us, a preacher comes and preaches a 30 to 40 minute message, we say a prayer and we walk out the door. You can sit through church and it was done to you. And that's not what church is. Liturgy is the work of the people. And if we're not careful, and, and my fear is that in our mega church movement, and I, again, I'm not throwing stones at anybody. You, we, listen, in our early days, we, we tried to copy the mega church vibe. So I'm not, throwing, I'm not throwing stones at big churches. It's very easy to follow into a trap that we're going to do church to you, and we're going to try to cater it in such a way that you like it enough that you will keep coming back. And that's not church. That's not worship. It is a response to this idea that, oh, I need to go to church because I'm a Christian. But what we eat matters as much as eating. How we worship matters as much as where we worship or worshiping altogether. Because worship is not merely a response. It is formative. I love what Tish Warren Tish Harrison Warren writes in her book, Liturgy of the Ordinary. She says, I worry that when our gathered worship looks like a rock show or an entertainment special, we are being formed as consumers. People after a thrill and a rush, when what we need is to learn a way of being in the world that transforms us day by day by the rhythms of repentance and faith. How we worship matters. And the Bible calls us into this place of response. And it's not, listen, I'm not saying that we've gotten it right, but we've gone to great efforts to make our services more participatory in nature. Where there's this rhythm of call and response, those songs we were singing this morning, what were we doing? Just declaring the goodness and the greatness of God. And as we enter into that truth, we experience and know God's goodness. We read scripture together because we need to be reminded of these truths. We come to the table every week. Why? Because we want to call to remembrance who God is and what God has done. And as we enter into that, we experience experience God in ways that we don't even realize. We do not go as far as the Catholics on transubstantiation that the, that the bread and the wine becomes literally the body and the blood of Jesus because that's a little weird. But we do believe that as only the Spirit can make possible that we meet Jesus at the table. Why? Because he said, as you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will know me. I'm not going to try to sit down and write a doctoral dissertation on what that means. 
Because theologians have tried for centuries, but we enter into the mystery of the presence of Christ. The table is set. It's our choice whether or not we're going to eat. Because every parent knows the challenge of slaving over a meal and putting it in front of a child that says, eh, I don't like that. Can we go to McDonald's? No, you little brat, you're going to starve and die. <laughs> and there's a lot of us today that spiritually are starving and dying. Oh, what a good way to redeem a joke. Because we have not feasted on the goodness that God has put before us at his table. And really quickly this morning, the corporate worship, the corporate gathering becomes a model for a life of private devotion. Because we can't survive on one meal a week. And as much as corporate worship is a response to who God is and what God has done, as much as corporate worship is formative in nature, it ultimately provides us a model for everyday living, that my life is to be lived in response. But I've got to do the work of calling to remembrance who God is and what God has done. And I do that through time in God's word. I open the word to hear again who God is and what God has done that I may offer myself in response. I carve out times of worship. It doesn't mean singing. It just means intentional focus, remembering, reminding myself, responding with gratitude and thanksgiving to who God is and what God has done in a time of prayer. Because prayer is our response to a conversation that God started. Listen today, for those that struggle in prayer, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to get God's attention. You don't need to get God's attention. He's the one that started the conversation. Prayer is just our humble response to it. And it's more about showing up than it is the words that we say. God desires communion with you. If you're a parent of a teenager, you know this. When they're 15, the very fact that they speak to you is all you need. If you can get more than a one-word response, how was your day? Good. As they slam the door to their room. If you get a two-sentence explanation, you're like, oh, your mom or dad heart is full. That's all God wants, communion. It is our response to who God is and what God has done. We talk about it this way here at Genesis. We talk about a first 15. It's just this rhythm of taking time out of our day. To respond to a God that's already initiated. Time in, God's, time in worship, time in God's word, time in prayer. I mean, you can literally read a chapter, five minutes, put on a worship song, just soak in the words if you have to, five minutes. And if you don't have enough going on in your life to take up five minutes of prayer, come talk to me. I can give you a few prayer requests that will easily fill up your five minutes. Worship is a response, but it's also formative. How we engage, how we worship. And corporate worship becomes the model for our private disciplines. How do we respond to a God who has called out to us? A God who has initiated this work. In light of who God is, in light of what God has done, worship is our faithful response. A giving of ourselves wholly and completely to God. This morning we're going to close a little differently as I was studying this week and researching I come across this beautiful song that is written in call and response format. So this morning as we prepare our hearts to come to the table of the Lord, I want you to watch this video, listen to the words of this song. If you're a technical, creative kind of person, take note of the video. It was shot in one continuous act. Some of you will find that interesting as well. But go ahead, Booth. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting? Do you wish 
that you could see it all made me Is all creation burning Is a new creation coming Is the glory Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah the grave he is David's root and the lamb who died to ransom the slave is he worthy is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory is he worthy of this he Does the Father truly love us? Does the Spirit move among us? And is Jesus our Messiah? Hold forever those He loves. Does our God intend to dwell again? Would you stand to your feet with us this morning? Ushers, if you guys will make ready the communion elements. In Revelation, we read, the angel cries out, is there anyone worthy? And what is the response? Yes, the lion of the tribe of Judah, who God is. He is the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the earth. What God has done, he is worthy. And the question that begs to be asked of us today, is he worthy? Is he worthy of a response of our whole lives? Not just an hour on a Sunday morning, an hour and a half on not so good days, but is he worthy of a life of response in light of who he is, in light of what he's done? You shall have no other gods before me. In light of who he is, in light of what he's done, let's offer ourselves as living sacrifices because in doing so, we will experience the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God.
Father, we love you this morning. We're thankful today for the gift of your spirit. Whose work, Jesus said, is to convict us, to convince us by opening our eyes to the truth of who you are and what you have done. To keep calling to our remembrance your faithfulness, your goodness, your faithful love that endures forever. To make it real, to make it personal, to make it experiential as we give ourselves fully and completely to you. This morning as the band begins to play and sing, God has called and we're going to respond. Jesus has initiated and we're going to enter in. He has set the table and we're going to come to the table today to feast. In light of who he is, he is the Lamb of God that was slain. In light of what he has done, this is my body, eat. This is my blood, offered up for you, drink. This morning, if you have confessed Jesus as Lord, if you have responded to God's invitation of grace, then this morning we invite you to this table to celebrate, to respond with us in worship to the goodness and the grace of of the Lord Jesus Christ as the began band begins to sing this morning. If you would come to one of the tables in the front, there's two tables in the back. Grab your communion elements and take them back to your seat and we will bless them all together here in just a moment. Holy Spirit 